This week, we'll look at our first frequently asked question about the Bible. And this question is more of a moral objection than a scientific one, but we'll address it just the same. The question is, why did God seemingly command genocide in the Old Testament? This question's been asked by many people over the years, and the answer's not very well known. So we'll take an in-depth look at what the question's referring to and the biblical answer over the next few weeks. In 1 Samuel 15.3, we see an example of a passage that is typically quoted along with this particular question where God commanded, Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child. Without context, we can admit this seems like a horrible command from God. So understanding the context of this and other similar passages, therefore, is very important to dealing with this question. To begin to answer the question, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning and the first book of the Bible called Genesis to understand what led up to this point in history. When God created the heavens and the earth, the day came to introduce his final creation, and then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Bible's very clear. Humans were the only part of the creation that was made in God's image. And we were specifically created to carry that divine image in the world while we managed the Lord's creation and fellowship with him in love. God was so serious about the fact that mankind was made in his image. This was actually the basis for the death penalty against murder. So, if someone killed a descendant of Adam... They were also assaulting the image of God, and it's because we're made in his image that our lives have certain intrinsic value. Being made in God's image is what makes mankind different from the rest of creation, and it's built right into our DNA as the instructions for how we're made. Well, when God put the man named Adam in the garden, he commanded the man not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and warned him that he would die if he ate from it. God provided an entire planet of unforbidden paradise and pleasure that was pure and perfect, and there was only one single rule in that world. All God really asked is that they obey him and avoid knowing or experiencing evil. The word here for knowledge can also be translated as experience, so God was simply commanding them to avoid the experience of evil. If they would simply obey him, then they would live in perfection and goodness forever, and they would never face any problems or know any evil at all in their world. Of course, we know that Satan tempted the woman named Eve, and she disobeyed God, and then gave the fruit to Adam also, and the rest is history. An epic struggle between good and evil began that day once evil was allowed into the world. Paradise was lost, and evil had invaded the garden through their rebellion. But they were still made in the image of God, and as we'll see, that becomes very important as we go along. As God was explaining the consequences of them opening up the door to evil, he also prophesied a very specific event that would come in the future. And that prophecy started a very specific sub-conflict between good and evil that would eventually lead us to our answer. God said that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent would bruise the seed's heel. This was a foreshadowing of the crucifixion when the seed, who was Jesus, would bruise Satan's head, and the seed's heel would be bruised in the process. Although from our perspective this event has already occurred and history is prophesied, all of history leading up to that point had an undercurrent of the serpent trying to avoid this outcome. And now we're ready to see how that part of the battle played out. 
since the seed of the woman was going to critically wound Satan, we should ask ourselves, what could Satan try to do to prevent this seed from coming? The word seed here, by the way, means offspring. So how could Satan try to block the woman from bearing this seed? Try to remember this question as we go along. Well, from the time of the fall, we need now to jump ahead a few chapters to Genesis chapter 6, to the time just before the flood came. Genesis chapter 6 begins by saying, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This is a very important passage that's explaining the condition of the world that led up to the flood, as the next few verses explain. Just a few verses later, God tells Noah that he needs to build an ark because all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, and earth was filled with violence through them. So God was going to wipe out this corruption from earth with a flood. So we can see that the catalyst for the flood was directly related to the description. The sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men, the men who were of old, men of renown. Let's begin by getting a cast of the non-divine characters in this strange passage that directly precedes the flood of Noah. We see there were men, the daughters of men, the sons of God, and giants. The text makes it clear that the daughters of men became wives to the sons of God, and they bore children to them, and these offspring were called giants, who were mighty men or men of renown. The first thing we'll look a little deeper into is this word translated giants. Obviously, as mighty men of renown, there's something very different going on about these strange beings. And how they came into the world seems to be the focus of this passage in general. Here are three different Bible translations that offer three different renderings for our key word. The Holman Christian Standard Translation calls them Nephilim. The King James and the New King James translations both call them giants. And Young's literal translation calls them fallen ones. So the next logical question is, which translation is correct? In a way, they're all correct. Nephilim is the correct English transliteration of the Hebrew word in this place called Nephil. Giant is physically how these beings are described later in the Bible. And fallen ones is an accurate translation of the Hebrew word into English. So, when the Bible speaks of these Nephilim, it means the giant fallen ones. As we continue, we'll see there's a very large thread of these giant fallen people all through the Bible. And this description from Genesis fits perfectly with the basic facts about these individuals also. It is very possible that these Nephilim are the serpent's attempt to disrupt the prophecy of the seed of the woman also, as we'll consider later. But before we go any deeper, we need to see where did these Nephilim come from? Clearly, the passage says that they are the offspring of two specific beings mentioned in our cast of characters, the sons of God and the daughters of men. As men grew in numbers on the earth, and they had daughters, the beings called the sons of God then lusted after those daughters and took them for wives and had children with them. These children were the giant fallen beings called Nephilim. And these children are also called mighty strong men who were very well known as men of renown. There is a controversy among Bible scholars today as to who the sons of God were. And we're going to focus in on that issue now. There's a clear contrast here between the sons of God, meaning the male offspring of God, and the daughters of men, who are literally the female offspring of the race of Adam, according to the Hebrew. 
The word here for men is the same word for Adam. So these daughters are indisputably the female offspring of Adam. And we should remember this fact as we consider who the sons of God were. The phrase sons of God is literally the sons of Elohim. And Elohim means God. The phrase daughters of men is literally the daughters of Adam. So that is self-evident. And the formula to arrive at a Nephilim giant fallen one is a son of God plus a daughter of Adam produces a Nephilim, and they are known as giant fallen ones. No one disagrees that the daughters mentioned in the passage were the descendants of Adam, and very few disagree with the obvious fact that the children of these relationships were giants called the fallen ones who were mighty and well known in the ancient world. The real controversy is centered around the identity of the sons of God. The two main views of the sons of God in Genesis 6 are the Sethite view and the angelic view. So we need to discuss what these two points of view are and what they both represent. I apologize, we have to go off on this rabbit trail, but we must absolutely establish the correct understanding of this passage because it has a tremendous impact on how we interpret many other key passages of the Bible that answer our initial question. Once we settle this debate, we can then interpret Genesis 6 and understand what exactly was happening in the world at the time of the flood that caused God to wipe out all air-breathing life from the surface of the earth except the remnant that was saved in the ark with Noah. Also, since these Nephilim appear later in the book of Numbers in the Promised Land, we really need to understand how they came into being. The premise of the Sethite view is typically based on the idea that the phrase sons of God is referring to the godly sons of Seth, and the phrase the daughters of men is referring to the ungodly daughters of Cain. Essentially, it's believed in this view that Adam's son Seth was godly, and therefore a son of God. But Adam's son Cain was ungodly, and therefore he was only a son of Adam. Then Seth's godly sons supposedly took wives from Cain's ungodly daughters, and they had children described as giants who were also fallen ones who were mighty men and men of renown. Notice that the sons and daughters in this view are both actually direct descendants of Adam, but the text only says that the daughters were descendants of Adam. And this is a major clue that something is wrong with this interpretation. Why would two different phrases be used to describe the union of the direct offspring of the first man, Adam? Why did the Bible not use the phrases, the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain in the Hebrew, if that's what God meant? Clearly, that would have been how to describe what this view believes, but the text did not describe things in this way at all. When Two parallel items are mentioned together in logically consistent writings such as the Bible. Finding what parallels exist and what the differences are helps you to understand the concepts better. For example, there are sons and daughters in this passage. So there are male and female genders being discussed. And we know from the text that they united as husband and wife, so to speak, and had offspring so we can verify that there were two opposing genders. Also, the text is obviously telling us that the sons of God were considered the offspring of God, but the women were considered the offspring of Adam, who had multiplied on the earth. This contrast necessarily implies that the sons of God are not sons of men or sons of Adam, and this must not be missed. There are two opposing lineages. If the sons of God were the offspring of men in any way, the logical sentence structure would change dramatically to stop reflecting these different lineages, which is the obvious focal point of the text. It's clear that this passage was written to reveal a mixing of lineages, so to speak, between the sons of God and daughters of men, meaning the daughters of Adam. Both the sons and daughters in the Sethite view are direct descendants of Adam, but the text clearly says that only the daughters were his direct descendants. The question is, 
Will we believe what the Bible has just said, or will we add to it and take away from it as we see fit? Also, why would two normal human beings, regardless of their obedience to God, have offspring described as giants in Numbers chapter 13 and as mighty men and men of renown in Genesis chapter 6? Why would the text even mention these human intermarriages and call their offspring fallen ones? I'm confident when I tell you there's not a single verse in the entire word of God to support this Sethite view of Genesis 6. It's simply a man-made idea imposed on the text with no biblical support at all. When literally interpreted, the sons of God are simply the direct offspring of God, not Adam. And the daughters of men are literally the direct daughters of Adam, as the Hebrew plainly says. These descriptions in the text of Genesis 6 are essentially genetic lineages, telling us who each group is directly descended from. The literal plain sense interpretation of the passage is that the sons of God are actually the offspring of God, but the daughters of men were the offspring of Adam. So, we simply need to see how the phrase sons of God is used in other places in the Hebrew scriptures, and we'll easily see who these sons of God are, and this actually is easy to do. The phrase sons of God in Genesis 6 is made up of two words. Sons is Strong's number H1121, and God is Strong's number H430. Using these two numbers in Strong's concordance, we can see where both of these words are used together in the Bible. The book of Job has three very important passages that use these two words together, and by looking at these three passages, we can clearly identify the sons of God. In Job 1.6, we read, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. First we can ask, did the sons of Seth come to present themselves before the throne of God? And if so, why were these godly men hanging around with Satan? Also, how could these human, unresurrected sons of Seth enter the presence of God? Obviously, the sons of God is not referring to the sons of Seth, but what are the sons of God? Since Satan is among them, perhaps the right question is, what is Satan? And if we answer that, then we'll know who the sons of God are that he's traveling with. Before we answer that, let's look at one more passage that reveals the sons of God seem to often come before the throne of God, and Satan was among them for at least two of these instances. As Job 2 explains, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So, now that Job has piqued our curiosity, we'll briefly look at some passages about Satan to see if he can serve as a clue to who the sons of God are. Revelation 12.9 describes the dragon as Satan and the serpent whose head was bruised based on the prophecy in the garden. And then the passage describes Satan being cast out of heaven with his angels. This tells us that Satan at some point was in heaven, but he was cast out. Also, when he fell, his angels were cast out with him. So, clearly Satan, or the devil, is closely associated with angels. In this passage, as well as the two in Job we just read, both indicate that at some point in time, the devil had access to heaven. In Matthew, Jesus also ties Satan and angels together, as he describes that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But those who side with Satan and rebel against God will also be sent to that place as well. It's clear from these passages, Satan is very closely associated with angels, and one other passage we'll look at next reveals why. In Ezekiel 28 we read, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. 
You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stone. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. This passage describes the origins of Satan. He was in the Garden of Eden and also in the holy mountain of God, which we normally call heaven. And Satan was and is a cherub, which is an angel. A cherub is the singular form of this type of angel, and cherubim is the plural. So Ezekiel describes these angels for us also. They have four faces and four wings, and they have the hands of a man under their wings. This is a description of the type of angel Satan is. At some point in history, the angel we know as Satan decided that he wanted to take God's position in throne, and this is the sin of pride that was found in him. So this is why Satan fell from his position, and although he still is an angel, we now know him as a fallen angel because he rebelled against God. Because these passages describe his origin and later passages describe the fact that he has angels that seem to fall with him, we interpret one more symbolic passage in Revelation to arrive at a general number for how many angels fell with Satan in history. As we saw earlier, the dragon or Satan was cast out of heaven with his angels. And here we see the dragon draw a third of the stars of heaven down with his tail. Also, this is the passage that has been historically used to conclude that when Satan fell, he drew one third of the angels of heaven down with him. Obviously, this is a very symbolic passage, so we cannot be sure of the number of angels who fell with Satan but we do know that many rebelled with him and they're now considered his angels and we call them the fallen angels. So, after these passages, we now know Satan is a cherub and cherubim are angels. That means that Satan is an angel. Also, many angels fell with Satan and they're now called Satan's angels by Jesus himself. So. Now that we know who Satan is, we can understand our passages in Job about the sons of God. Remember that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and both times Satan came among them. Since Satan is an angel, it would seem to make sense, in a Sesame Street kind of way, that the sons of God he was traveling with were also angels. But we won't stop here. There's one more passage in Job that uses the same exact two words together for sons of God, and that passage eliminates all doubt as to who the sons of God are. In Job 38, God asked, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So, when God was making the world and laying the foundations of the earth, the sons of God were there shouting for joy. If the sons of God actually means the sons of Seth, as some claim, then they must have had a time machine in the days before the flood because this verse talks about when God was making the earth before he made Adam. God was laying the foundations of the earth and forming it in this passage. So this is clearly before Adam existed. But here we see the exact same Hebrew phrase for the sons of God used to describe the beings who were shouting for joy as the earth was made by God. Clearly, without a doubt, the phrase sons of God means the angels, as proved by this passage. But wait, there's more. Interestingly, even with all this evidence, some still try to claim that the sons of God are not angels. So, God gave us even more evidence to conclusively demonstrate it. Not only are there more passages in the Bible that prove it, as well as passages that deal with every objection to the sons of God being angels, there's also one more 
incontrovertible proof from history that's very telling. There was an ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament created around 200 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and that translation is called the Septuagint. There were 70 or 72, according to some, Hebrew scholars who were commissioned to translate the existing Hebrew Bible into Greek from around 300 to 200 BC. And the Septuagint is what they produced. We can tell that this is the primary Bible used by the writers of the New Testament and the early Christian church because the majority of Old Testament quotes in the New Testament actually cite the Septuagint variants and not the Masoretic variants. So we can trust that this was and is a very highly respected ancient translation of the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus and his disciples used when they quoted the Old Testament. In the Septuagint, that passage we just read in Job was translated into Greek, and a very interesting thing happened. The 70 ancient Greek scholars actually translated the phrase Bene Elohim into the word Agalos, or angels in English. So, 200 years before Jesus, the best scholars understood that the sons of God were, in fact, angels, and the Septuagint proves this point conclusively once and for all. This should end the debate and debunk the sons of Seth view for good. But just in case there are some die-hard Sethite fans out there, which I know there are, we need to answer their most common objections before we see why the angelic view makes so much sense and even answers our foundational question. When we return next week, we will look at those objections and move on in our study 